Luxin is a brand that you may not have heard of, though they're not actually a new company. Luxin falls under the Zidu group, which also owns Eversolo, who's made some very nice streamer DAC combo units, the DMP A6 and A8, among others. And a lot of that experience has been carried over to this, the Luxin X9, a DAC and headphone amp combo, which particularly for headphone listeners, has some unique features that could be quite enticing. Coming in at just under $1,000, is this the best option for your money, or is the old advice of separates over combos still true today? Well, let's find out. The design of the X9 is quite striking, with an angled diamond cut faceplate, black ridged side panels, and a large touchscreen display used for both showing visual info about what is being played, or VU meters, and for controlling the various settings and features of the X9, of which there are many. The I.O. is packed, quite a bit more so than most other products, especially at this price. You've got the usual XLR and RCA outputs, USB-B, C and SBDIF input, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth antennas, HDMI ARC input, but what I really like to see is the subwoofer outputs, which not only allow you to use this as a DAC and preamp in a speaker system with subwoofers and not have any messy splitters cluttering things up, but they can also be configured in the menu with a low pass filter to help integrate your subwoofers perfectly. You can adjust cutoff frequency, slope steepness, choose to run your subs in mono or stereo, and they've got independent gain adjustment, though no ability to do timing offset adjustment between the subs and speakers, and no ability to high pass the speaker slash main outputs as well, unfortunately. The DAC inside this product is the latest flagship AKM4499EX chip, but it's also got a built-in op-amp based headphone amplifier, and it can accept single-ended analog inputs if you wanted to run a secondary source such as a vinyl setup into this as your system hub. Though the analog inputs aren't analog through and through, they do get converted back to digital internally with an internal ADC, so not necessarily the best in terms of purity for vinyl or analog enthusiasts, but it does mean that even if you're using the analog inputs, the extra features, the DSP, EQ, crossfeed, that kind of stuff, all of that does still work when you're using the analog inputs. All of the volume is also done via a discrete R2R circuit, which gives you perfect channel matching at all levels, and that oh-so-satisfying clicky relay sound, which always makes me smile. The flexibility in terms of I.O. here is more than comprehensive. The only extra thing which I would have kind of liked to see is Rune streaming support, because it does have Wi-Fi, and again, Eversolo makes Rune-ready streamers, so maybe that'll come in a future firmware update, who knows. And as to the headphone amplifier itself, it's decently powerful, getting about 3.5 watts output at 32 ohm, and delivering up to 17 volts output into higher impedance headphones. It also has a headphone impedance detection feature, which automatically adjusts the volume range depending on the impedance of the headphone that you are using. Now, I've got to be honest, I'm not such a big fan of this particular feature. Headphone impedance alone has always been a bad way to judge how hard something is to drive, and that's even more true today, with countless low impedance but low sensitivity and hard to drive planars on the market, and many high impedance but high sensitivity and easy to drive dynamic headphones as well. Impedance alone is just not a good way to judge how much volume something needs or how difficult a headphone is to drive, and I just find that this feature makes it a little harder to know where my volume's going to end up until I turn it down and then go from the start again. I would just prefer to turn it off and just have the volume output be consistent. And actually on that topic, the Headphones.com Power Calculator recently got a revamp and some new features, so if you want to work out exactly how much power your headphones need, head to the link in the description to try out the new revamped Power Calculator, or go watch this video for an explanation of why certain headphones are harder to drive than others, and how much power you actually need, and why the power output spec of an amp might be kind of misleading. Everything that we do on this channel is made possible by Headphones.com, so if you like the work that we do and want to help support it, as well as buy from somewhere with excellent customer service and a 365 day return policy, then consider Headphones.com for your next audio purchase. Before we talk about actual performance, there are a couple more features that I need to talk about. Some good stuff, some bad stuff. Now, crossfeed is probably the one that you're most familiar with. It feeds some of the left channel into the right channel and vice versa, with a little bit of a delay and a frequency cutoff. And um, this aims to try and push the perceived stereo image out in front of you a bit, which can be pretty helpful for tracks that are mastered specifically for speakers. Now, I don't personally like listening to crossfeed for general listening. I find that it mostly messes things up, but Boy, some of those older Beatles tracks need it, where you've got stuff just on the left or just on the right, and it can be pretty jarring to listen to on headphones. So, Crossfeed isn't something that I would recommend using for general listening, but it is nice to have for older tracks that just didn't even consider headphones as listening devices when they were made. 
Next, there is a stereo width adjustment feature, which is a digital mid-side adjustment. And what this is doing is basically looking at the two channels, left and right, and seeing what content is similar, i.e. the stuff that's supposed to be in the middle, or different, i.e. the stuff more off to the sides, and it adjusts the amplitude of the differences. We can have a look at what this is doing if we create a test signal to see what's going on. Playing a 500Hz and a 1kHz tone in the left channel, and in the right channel we also play a 1kHz tone and a 3kHz tone. The 1kHz tone is playing in both, but the 500 and the 3kHz tone are only playing in one or the other, and if we have a look, we can see that when this feature is off, they're all about the same level, but when we turn the feature on and put it up to max, the differences have been amplified to be higher in level than the stuff that is shared. This can help widen the perceived stereo image, and personally I think it's a feature that more stuff should have. It's somewhat similar to the implementation of the stereo bass adjustment on the Zale HM1 amplifier, though I will say that I do prefer the implementation on the HM1 not just because it's done in analog, but also it's got some extra stuff going on there to help compensate for some of the issues that can crop up when you apply mid-side adjustments, whereas the X9 does not. Still a really nice feature to have, especially since it's adjustable. Then there's the biggest feature, one that I'm most happy to see, and also the one that I've got the most to complain about, so strap in for a little bit of a rant. EQ. The X9 has a full parametric built-in EQ, though in order to configure it, you do have to download the Luxin app. You cannot create or edit profiles on the device itself, which is a shame, especially given as Eversolo does already have this on the DMP A6. So Luxin, if you're watching, take the menu from the Eversolo and put it on this. It would be really nice to be able to create and edit custom EQ profiles on the device itself without having to use your phone. Though I will say, their app is quite nice. Zidu does a really good job with software on their products just all around. What you can set up on the device itself is auto EQ correction profiles which attempt to correct the frequency response of the headphone you select to the target that you select. And this is where I'm not so thrilled. There is no information about where all the measurements of these headphones have been sourced from, what rigs they were measured on, and there are two critical issues in terms of the actual corrections that then get applied. Firstly, it does not seem that it's doing any proper compensation for the HRTF of the measurement rig used to measure the headphones, and this means that the results you get and the correction that gets applied is going to vary substantially depending on what measurement rig those headphones happen to be measured on. You cannot just take any measurement of a headphone and correct it to any target you like because the measurement rig itself impacts the measurement that you get. If you take a headphone and measure it on a grass rig and then measure it again on a b k 5128 you will get different results. And as a result, you'll get different required compensations to make them fit whatever target line you are trying to get them to. You also cannot just take any measurement of any headphone and correct it to any target when they weren't developed for the same rig as what the headphone was measured on. You can't take a measurement taken on a grass rig for a headphone and correct it to the HRTF of the 5128 or the LMG target which was designed for the 5128. Just like you can't take a measurement from a 5128 and directly correct it to the Harman target which was not designed for that rig or a 711 target which is not even meant for over ears at all. Automatic EQ correction without any compensation for the HRTF of the rig the headphones were measured on is not going to give great results, and in my own subjective testing, most of the combinations of both headphones and targets on here did sound kind of weird. But then there's a second issue, which is that all of these headphone correction profiles are trying to completely correct things all the way up to 20 kilohertz, and the problem is that above about 2 kilohertz or so, everyone's individual HRTF varies massively. The results of any particular headphone on your head are almost certainly not going to be the same as on anyone else's head or on any particular measurement rig. So if you look at a particular measurement, doesn't matter if it's on a grass rig or a 5128, and you see that there's a big treble dip at 10 kilohertz, and you try and correct it, it might correct it for that particular position on that particular rig, but when you put it on, you'll hear a massive peak because that dip was never there for you to begin with. The massive variation in how headphones behave above a few kilohertz on people's heads means that you cannot accurately correct things based on any particular measurement, and you shouldn't try to do so because chances are you are just completely messing up the treble response, and that was my experience when using most of the headphone and target combinations on this. It just created peaks where I didn't have them before, or created dips where they weren't there before. It doesn't actually fix anything. Now to be clear though, this is not a Luxin issue, this is just an automatic EQ issue, and I would personally recommend avoiding automatic EQ options like this entirely. Quite frankly, I think that auto EQ stuff like this is one of the major reasons why a lot of people have a negative view 
of EQ. They try solutions like this, don't like the results, and assume that, fairly enough, it's EQ messing things up. But actually, it's not that EQ is messing things up, it's that the EQ is not being applied correctly in the first place. It's not actually necessarily correcting things to a target in the first place, and even if it is, it's not going to get that target when you put it on your head. If you want to EQ things properly, you just kind of have to do it by ear at higher frequencies. Learning to EQ properly is one of the best things you can do to improve headphone listening, and I would highly recommend that you go and watch Resolve's video on a little bit of starter information on how to do that. Okay. Sorry for the rant about that, I just had to get that off my chest. Let's stop talking about features, let's talk about performance, starting with objective performance. As a standalone DAC, the X9 performs very well. Total harmonic distortion and noise falling around minus 120 dB, jitter performance is excellent, as are most other metrics. Intermodulation distortion is low, distortion versus level is extremely consistent, distortion versus frequency only rises a little bit at the highest frequencies, and actually I find that that can often be kind of a good thing. Crosstalk is okay, getting up to around minus 90 dB at higher frequencies, and when we swap to using this as a headphone amp as well, performance remains very similar with a couple small caveats. When you swap from balanced to single-ended, you do see quite a bit more spurious noise showing up. Very low in level and not really a concern, but a little bit odd and definitely seems better to stick to balanced if you can. And when you put a more difficult 32 ohm load onto the amp, one channel increases in distortion a fair bit more than the other, which isn't ideal if you're running particularly hard to drive planars for instance. Power capability is decent, with just over 3.5 watts at 32 ohm and 17 volts output into high impedance headphones, meaning you'll be able to comfortably run most headphones without issue on this. Though given the price of this unit, it would have been nice to see it have a little more output power, I don't really think it's going to make much of a difference in most cases, but nonetheless, many even much cheaper amps do have 6 watts at 32 ohm output, would have been nice to see this match that. So how does it actually sound? Well, I'm a little unsure how to feel about the X9 because this is definitely a very good product, but I'm not certain that it's the best option for your money, even compared to some of Zidu's own other products. Just using this as a standalone DAC, not using the internal headphone amp, but instead comparing with my reference amplifier, I prefer the DAC in this to the Eversolo DMP A6, but I like the Eversolo DAC Z8 a little more than this. The X9 has a very neutral presentation, with a touch more overall density to the sound compared to the DAC Z8, but it also just comes across a little bit less engaging. For the vast majority of music, classical, pop, jazz stuff, Jeff Goldblum and the Mildred Snitzer Orchestra's new album is great, go listen to that, there wasn't really much difference. Both of them sounded great, and any differences were really, really splitting hairs. Where I did start to lean more towards the DAC Z8 was when I put on something really punchy. Particles by Polaroid, for example, just kicked harder on the DAC Z8, and the X9 by comparison felt a teeny bit held back. It's not that this is any less detailed than the DAC Z8. The Z8, maybe it's a little bit more forward with its detail, a little sort of sparklier, but it's not actually got any more real resolution. It's just a slight difference in presentation. But the real difference was that when you put on something punchy, the leading edge of harder hitting stuff just felt a little bit more rounded off on the X9, whereas the Z8 just felt a bit more energetic. And as a result, for those sorts of genres, I just had a better time listening on the Z8. Using this as a DAC and amp combo and comparing to another DAC and amp combo with almost identical power output, the JDS Element 4, this was a little bit more of a contrast in sound. The JDS Element 4 is just a touch warmer, maybe a hair behind in sheer resolution and detail for the really low level background stuff in Adam Baldrich's Passacaglia for instance, but it did also seem to have a slightly more tight and impactful sound, as well as being a little bit more open in terms of staging. The bigger difference between these two came when you put a Sesvara or a Modhouse Tungsten on them. With more demanding headphones, the Element 4 sounded like it was behaving the same basically no matter what. Whereas the X9, once you turn it up to louder levels, started to get a little bit softer sounding and a little bit more congested. These were all pretty small differences, but these small differences are more of a concern when there's a big difference in price. The Element 4 is nearly half the price of the X9, and the DAC Z8 is a couple hundred dollars cheaper as well, although that doesn't really have an amplifier that's capable of driving harder to drive headphones, mostly more sensitive stuff, so you would need to factor that into your budget as well. Now, having said that, the DAC Z8 with a $220 shit Midgard is almost exactly the same price as the X9, and I think it's a better sounding setup as well as being more powerful. So in terms of value for pure sound quality, it's fine, but for half the price, the Element 4 is, I would say, just as good, just a little bit different in presentation. And if you are willing to go for separates, you can build a better system for the same money. 
What really differentiates the X9 is the features. Once you add a little bit of EQ, a tiny bit of mid-side adjustment, the overall experience is just plain better. And I would consider these because the differences that EQ, crossfeed, and mid-side adjustment all make are much bigger than the differences between DACs themselves. The X9 is absolutely feature-packed, but it commands a price premium because of that. If you value these features, then this could absolutely be a great option versus most other similarly priced products. But if you're just looking for sound quality, Eversolo's own DAX Z8 is, I think, a slightly better DAC at a couple hundred dollars less. And if you spend a couple hundred dollars more, the Holocyan 2 is substantially better. Most people looking at this will be looking for a DAC amp combo though, and the only real reason to go for this over, say, an Element 4 is the extra features it has beyond EQ, which the Element 4 also has. And I'm not necessarily sure that it's worth paying nearly twice as much for them. If Luxin can add rune streaming support for this, that for me personally anyway would change the maths a fair bit, but at the moment I think my conclusion is that this is a really solid product, it's just facing some pretty stiff competition. And so whether it makes sense for you depends entirely on whether you are prioritizing pure sound quality for the money, or if the extra features this has, the EQ, the crossfeed, mid-side adjustment, subwoofer outputs, that one actually I think is probably one of the bigger ones that doesn't get talked about, then maybe this is a good option. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. If you wanted to ask any questions at all about DACs, amps, headphones, music, gear, or anything else at all, then come and say hey on the headphones.com Discord server or the headphones.com forum, and I and other Wiggly Air enthusiasts will endeavor to help. Until next time, hit the like button if you like content like this, subscribe so that you can see more of it, and I'll see you next time.